This is part two to our 3D printed sheet metal webinar from back in March. And the reason we're posing this press break question is be, well, you know, actually now that I think of it, um, I think it'll be clear if I just show you what happened in part one. I just can't do it, Captain. I don't have the power. I'm too weak. <laughs> oh. You're what the French call les incompetents. What? Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Is that the best you can do? Do it! Just do it! <laughs> <laughs> You serious? You gotta do better than that. It doesn't work as a as a thing on a table. Perfect. It doesn't work. <laughs> but it doesn't work. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it kind of worked. The dies in the drill press vise could stamp really thin gauge metal, but you can forget the thicker stuff. And I know that. Since most sheet metal customers are bending and stamping sheet metal, that's quite a lot thicker than 8 thou tin and 10 thou brass. We decided to go back and revisit this webinar to truly test the capabilities of 3D printed sheet metal tooling. Only this time, we'll be using proper equipment. Now, our stamping die will still feature our MLC logo as before, but we had to make some minor alterations to the file so that the die can be now compatible with a different piece of equipment. My coworker, James Frick, went back into a SolidWorks assembly of the original Vice compatible die and modified it to be compatible with a press break. Now the press break in question is an old 200 ton unit that belongs to one of our longtime SolidWorks customers, AMK Manufacturing. More on them later. With the setup complete, it was time to prepare the two die halves for printing. When it comes to 3D printing strong parts, there are strengthening methods that can be performed in CAD. These are things like fillets and gussets, ribs. These are all great strategies, but due to our fitment limitations in the press break, there really wasn't much we could do in CAD to make these dies stronger. So that leaves us with relying on the print settings we choose in the slicer. And since we'll be printing these dies using our MarkForge composite printers, I know we can make these parts rock solid. When discussing part strength, you must first consider orientation. FDM parts are not predictably durable across every axis. So what I mean by this is if the XY plane represents the print bed, FDM parts are very strong when resisting force is applied in this XY plane. But when you start talking about point loads applied in the XZ or YZ plane, FDM parts don't really handle that nearly as well. The reason for this is due to a phenomenon called layer delamination, which just means that the layer to layer bonding is not very robust when under load. Now, fortunately, in our case, we have a uniform or distributed load across the die's faces. So we have more flexibility in the orientation we choose. The next thing to consider is the surface detail we want for our logo. Obviously, we want this to be high so that we can get a crisp stamp. Faces in the XZ or YZ plane always exhibit the best surface finish on an FDM part, so we want our logo to be on one of these faces. So with all this in mind, we have two options. We can either orient the part like this, or like this. Now standing the part up vertically means print time will increase, but we won't have support material. And if you've seen a couple of my webinars, you know I really hate support material. That's why we opted for this orientation. But if time is a more critical metric for you, you can print it in the other orientation. From here, let's choose our materials. Onyx is Mark IV's longest running, easiest printing, and one of their strongest materials. Plus, it's reinforceable, so a lot for that. And speaking of reinforcement, let's choose a fiber. We have both fiberglass and carbon fiber available in our inventory. Carbon fiber provides the highest strength to weight ratio, while fiberglass 
is a great all-around fiber reinforcer at an unbeatable cost. One of the Mark Forge AEs, I remember, he said that fiberglass can handle 90% of load-bearing applications. Therefore, we ended up printing a set in each. The other difference between the two fibers is that fiberglass only prints at 0.1 millimeter layer heights, whereas carbon fiber only prints at 0.125 millimeter layer heights. Now that our materials are locked down, let's take a look at our infill settings. 37% triangular infill is default because it is a very optimized case of strength to surface finish to print time. So I almost never change that. Roof and floor layers are fine to leave as is since this isn't really relevant to the strength of this part and its current orientation. However, our wall layers will be very important to review. Customers ask me sometimes how they should modify the infill percentage or the infill itself to get higher strength parts. But in reality, the infill doesn't provide much in terms of strength to the part. It's really the wall layers that are a more significant metric to review. CNC Kitchen has a whole video testing this, and it's a pretty interesting watch, so highly recommend you check it out. Now, two walls is the default from Mark Forged, but as you saw, we bumped it up to six just to enhance the strength of the part. Now, you might be asking, wait, uh, what about fiber? How do we go about kind of modifying that? We can actually do this in our X-ray view. On the right, as you see here, we have two panels. These panels capture the fiber groups at the top and at the bottom of the part. We call these sandwich panels. Currently, these are set to isotropic, which means the entire layer is filled with fiber. This doesn't help us much because isotropic fiber fill resists forces in the XY plane. Since our logo is on one of the vertical faces and this face is going to be uh, resisting the forces, the compressive load as it's uh, squashed down in the press break, we want to go about swapping our fill type from isotropic to concentric. Concentric rings resist forces in the XZ or YZ planes, so it's exactly what we want. The theory behind all of this is really well explained in the Mark Forge University Composites course which is probably the best 3D printing course I've ever taken. It took me about four years of learning on my own via YouTube as a 3D printing hobbyist. It took all of that knowledge in four years and condensed it down into a very concise course. Uh, it's, it's really fantastic. I can't speak highly enough about it. And if you're interested in accessing this course, just reach out to us. It's included with the one-year warranty and the coverage plans for Mark Forge printers. Anyway, Let's go about applying the concentric fiber rings through the entirety of the part. Now, one downside here is our print time went up very high from uh, about 12 and a half hours up to almost 18. So it's actually very efficient to, instead of choosing the entire group for our fiber pattern type here, to drop this down and select stripes. I highly recommend this when it comes to concentric fiber applications. For our application, we opted for 20 stripes of fiber, and we leave the four fiber layers per stripe at four. So I'll just highlight this and select 20. And I'll select Apply Changes. Another benefit of striping is how Iger sandwiches every strip with solid infill. This helps to provide additional strength beyond just the fibers themselves. We simply repeated this process with the other dies and the other fiber types and hit print. Since we have an X7 and a Mark II in our office, we were able to get these parts printed much quicker than if we had only had one printer. I love having more bandwidth to work with, for sure. Also, if you're strategic with when you start a print job, it feels like a time warp. Starting a print in the afternoon and having it ready in the morning is so nice. 3D printing definitely is lights out manufacturing. Okay, parts are ready. It's always fun to remove the bill platform to better observe the beauty of these parts. The two die sets look great and they felt super robust. So we were really excited to put these to the test. All that was left was to schedule some time with a press break. And there was one person that came to mind who could hook us up. 
Her name is Anna, and she's the owner of AMK Manufacturing over in Alpharetta, Georgia. From multi-axis CNC machining, sheet metal forming and bending, welding and laser cutting, Anna and her team help customers all over with their fabrication needs. So let's step in and check it out. To start, I was blown away by the size of this press brake. It's 200 ton rated, and you can tell, the cylinders on this thing are almost as big around as my torso. Comparing our 3D printed die to a machined one that Anna frequently uses, you can see our dimensions are on point. I can't claim the credit for this because it was James who designed these, and he did a really nice job. Because the dies were shorter than the standard ones she uses, she mounted an extender to account for the shorter stroke. From there, it was just a matter of getting everything lined up. While Anna is tending to that, let me go and show you the hand-cut sheet metal blanks we brought with us. We had 25 thou aluminum, 25 thou copper, 16 thou brass, 16 thou aluminum, 10 thou brass, and 8 thou tin. I think that makes 24 total blanks. So yeah, we definitely came prepared. Back at the press break, everything was set up and ready. Our first test was 16 thou aluminum using our fiberglass reinforced die. Here we go. After the first stamp, it looked decent, but we needed a bit more squeeze. The way this press break works is you set offsets from zero, zero being total contact between the two dies. Anna sets it a bit wide just to avoid damaging the dies and then lowers it progressively based on the stamp result. So despite 200 tons being applied with every stroke, the offsets are essentially how we adjust the tonnage applied on this die. Just wanted to clarify that. After another adjustment, Here's what our first official stamp looks like. Really stoked with this result. Now, it's time to up the ante. Our next victim, to quote Anna, was 25 thou aluminum. This was our thorn from the first webinar. I mean, I couldn't even use my car to stamp this thickness. So let's see how the press break handles it. Where we ended up is where we're going to start this one. Wow, piece of cake. What an improvement that is. From there, we stamped our 25 thou copper. And then we stamped the 16 thou brass. With all these successes, I was feeling really confident at this point. So I asked Anna if she had some more brutish material. It was only later that I realized the naivety of this question when Anna revealed that 36,000 stainless steel is what she considers feeble. And that is exactly what we stamp next. This stuff is really stiff, so I was getting pretty concerned. With the first stamp, you can see that there is an impression of our logo there, but it wasn't brilliant. So Anna went about lowering the offsets even more. Well, here we go. See if that helps out. I got a carbon fiber set here too. That one. You saw how much I compressed the dial. I did, yeah. Considering the embossed and engraved heights of the lettering, our surface offsets, and the vast difference in elasticity moduli between the two materials. We just weren't going to get as fine as a result as we saw with our thinner materials. But who cares? Let's go even thicker. Here is 60 thou aluminum. Oh yeah, I'm seeing a bulge. See, it's just... Yeah, this was the coup de grace for our dyes. You can actually see visible damage occur to the lower die during the actual compression stroke. It really took a beating. 
Looking around the die, you can see that the roof and floor layers collapsed, causing wrinkling on the sides of the die, and the infill got crushed too. But we weren't throwing in the towel yet, because we had our carbon fiber die set to test. First, we ran the 36 thou steel through. Seated the dies really nicely though. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it kind of looks like a similar result to what we got with our fiberglass die sets. But regardless, we went about and tested that 60 thou aluminum piece as well. Oof. <laughs> Didn't like that. Oh man, you can actually hear the crushing of the dies with that. That is brutal. The damage on this set is very similar to what we saw with the fiberglass set. However, we didn't see the same infill destruction. And I just chalked this up to the higher stiffness that the carbon fiber imparts to these dies. And I wanted to show the damage to the fiberglass dies one more time as a nice comparison. It's really interesting to see how things fail. And speaking of failure points, we did not run these dies through simulation in Iger because we were interested in the point of failure, not necessarily deflection. So it wasn't really relevant here. Well, that wraps it up for me. But all this work made us think, I wonder how a 3D printed sheet metal bending die would do. So maybe a part three coming in 2025, stay tuned for that. But anyway, I guess uh, open it up for some questions.